word closer, this is going to be beyond your mental grasp. <laughs> Get closer. <laughs> All right, it's a cold day, stand closer together. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Yes, welcome to Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress of Town, London. Again, we've got a little plan. We're going to have going to be the guide, and together we're going to tour the fortress. And I'm going to point out some of the famous buildings and structures. You're going to look at them, then I'm going to bore you to death with their history. Got that? Okay, look up there. Look back. That was Tower Hill. Let's draw that because it's a hill, but it's near the town. Tower Hill was the site of the public execution scaffold, and I will forgive a lot of you for thinking that the Tower of London is all about prisoners and executions. It isn't. The Tower of London has never been a prison. It has always been a palace and fortress. What is it? Palace and fortress. fortress. Good. Glad you've grasped that. Unofficially, we had three and a half thousand prisoners here. Three and a half thousand and one soon. <laughs> Contrary to... Right, do you want to shut up now? <laughs> Where are you from? Australia. Where are you people from? Australia. Australia. A bit quiet. <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to have to ask you people, because you are a disruptive influence, right? There are people here who pay top rate to come here, and you're disrupting it. So you either shut up or you move on. Got that? Good. <laughs> right. Now, contrary to popular belief, we didn't execute all our prisoners. We only executed 363. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's about one in ten. There's a ratio that's better than the current state of Texas. <laughs> now, very few executions took place within the walls of the tower, and I don't like talking about prisoners and executions, but I've got to, and this is the best place to do it, because most of them took place outside on Tower Hill. But there on execution day, there'd be thousands of bloodthirsty people, not unlike yourselves, <laughs> gathered around a raised wooden platform. We call this the scaffold. It was covered with straw, and that was there to absorb the blood. Amidst this would stand a man clad in leather, and a leather mask covered half his face. It's always been possible to buy this kind of clothing in London. I'm sure some of you know where. He was the executioner, and the tools of his trade were a block of oak and a war axe. It was considered noble to have your head removed with a weapon of war. Only the nobility would afford it. It was also a custom when the condemned man went up there to shake hands with your executioner and pass him a purse of gold and silver coins. There was religious significance to this, that your last act on earth was one of forgiveness. But in truth, the strange thing is that that was how the executioner got paid. He was appointed by the state, employed by the state, but paid for by the customer. You might be wondering what would happen if you refused to pay your executioner. I can tell you that. Yeah, well, it is a slow day. Yeah. James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth, famously refused to pay his executioner, and his executioner, Jack Kex, just got grumpy. When James Scott stretched his neck across the block of oak, Jack Kex brought his axe crashing down. Back! Right through James Scott's left shoulder. Now, we know this detail because there were recordings, people whose job it was to write down or draw everything they saw and heard. Some of these records still exist in the National Archive. They tell us that at the fifth stroke of the axe, James Scott fell silent. A further three strokes of the axe, the head was still attached. So after eight strokes of the axe, he put the axe down and took out a knife and had to rip through the last bits of flesh, bone and gristle. The head was then impaled on a soldier's pike, paraded through the streets of London and left on London Bridge as a warning to other traitors. And it also served as an early form of bird feeder. So it was environmentally friendly. Meanwhile, the headless corpse was brought back inside the fortress for burial in the chapel, close to where we're going to end our tour. Prisoners and execution is a very small part of the tower's history. My passion here is medieval defensive architecture. I bet you're really glad you've got my tour. <laughs> if you look that way for a moment, you will see the ice rink. If you were to watch carefully, someone will fall over and hurt themselves soon, <laughs> and I find that rather amusing. <laughs> The ice rink is not a traditional feature of medieval defensive architecture. <laughs> However, what is remarkable is that our moat is wide enough to accommodate an ice rink. The moat is wider than most people expect because this is not Disneyland. This is a real fortress and that's a real defensive line. The moat is 130 feet across, which was further than an archer could shoot accurately. Our archers on the ramparts could shoot anyone trying to cross the moat in relative safety from anyone on the far side who took a shot at them. Twice a day, the tidal flow of the River Thames would flood in, 
and ebb out. This kept the moat clean. Clever? Yes. Clever. Not really, no. At low tide, the moat would dry out. If there was an enemy, they could just run across. <laughs> waste of time. In 1381, we employed a consultant. He did what all consultants do. Took a barrel load of money, left us with a sentence. He said we should dig the moat deeper than the riverbed. He said it would never fully drain and always present an obstacle. Why we hadn't thought of that, I don't know. <laughs> but that's what we did. Clever? Yes. Not yeah. really, no. The secondary function of the moat was that of toilet. Two and a half thousand people lived inside this fortress and tens of thousands lived around the outside. Every one of these people, and most of them more than once a day, added to the contents of the moat. You do know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, it doesn't always float. It won't float unless you have a high fat diet. You know that? This is science, children. High fat, floaty poo. But you can experiment at home. Yes, yeah, yeah, with someone with a high fibre diet, it will sink, and high fat will float, alright? Do it in the bath, kids. No one will tell you off, it's science. I really don't like children. Anyway, um, at low tide, the moat became little more than a mire of raw human poo. Carcasses from the meat market at Smithfield were also dumped in there. Plague victims were tossed in. We had everything in the moat. Typhoid, anthrax, plague, polar bears. <laughs> we had polar bears in the moat because the Tower of London was the first zoo anywhere in Britain. It housed the Royal Menagerie. And we had a Royal Menagerie because the kings and queens of Europe didn't like each other very much, but they had to be civil. So they gave each other gifts. A bit like a family Christmas, really. Gifts that no one would want. 1326, the King of France gave us an elephant. Thank you. <laughs> the elephant cost us a fortune to look after, and I'm sure France knew it would. <laughs> we were given lions and tigers too. The polar bears were a gift from King Olaf of Norway. They were allowed to swim in the moat to catch fish. That wasn't all they caught. They caught cholera and died. <laughs> so as a toilet, the moat was a complete failure. But as a line of defence, I think you'll agree, it did work rather well. <laughs> but it stank, and this is a royal palace. You don't put up with a smell like that in a royal palace. The moat didn't last very long. Near 500 years later, in 1843, the moat was drained, was filled in about 15 feet, five metres to the height you see today, and was then laid to lawn. Look how lush and green the grass grows. <laughs> it is incredibly fertile ground. <laughs> now, the outer wall there, that was built in the 1280s. Two strong bastions to the north dominate the approaches from the city. And there, if you're sharp eyed, you will note that in Tudor times, they were modified to house cannon. Along this line, we have six towers facing south, and they defend us against any attack that might come from up the river. The Byward Tower there is just one of them, but that's unique. That's the only landward entrance into the fortress. It's known as a Barbican Tower. There are two turrets and a gateway in the middle. And as you go through the gateway, have a look up, you might notice the spikes on the port pulleys, or drop gate. That drop gate weighs one and a half tonne. It dates from 1286, and so does the rope which holds it up. So we're going to go through there rather quickly. It's the most famous entrance in the Tower of London, Traitor's Gate. Come on, the word was quickly, let's go. Come on, I don't care if you're limping ketchup. <laughs> the the old people. It is an amazing fact that the elderly just don't realise how little time they may have left. <laughs> this could be your last holiday, so make the most of it, let's go. Cram it all in before you die. <laughs> right, push in, close. I don't want to go through this conversation at every block. You move quick, you get close. Closer. Right. As we came through, someone asked me if I'd shaved this morning. The answer is yes. Although it appears that I haven't, I am between beards. Right? Between beards. I had a beard, I shaved it off, I'm growing another. <laughs> Surely you should know about these things. And the relevancy. Yeah. No, 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 I've just been, uh, just been accused of being scruffy and I'm not, that's it. Yeah, so there we are. I also asked if I'm a soldier. No, I'm not. I used to be. In order to be a yeoman warder, you must have a minimum of 22 years military service and overwhelmingly we are drawn from the army. We do have four from the Royal Air Force. No one talks to them. <laughs> we also have two Royal Marines and these are instantly identifiable because they're usually holding hands. <laughs> you have to reach the rank of Sergeant Major. 
that might make me seem a little scared. <laughs> right. If you have all of that, you can apply to join the Yeoman of the Guard, Queen's personal bodyguard for ceremonial and state occasions. And if you've also got the Meritorious Service Medal, you get invited. I was invited. Yeah. Now, on those occasions, we do wear a very different uniform. I know you're disappointed not to see me in it today. That is the Tudor bonnet, white ruff, scarlet and gold tunic with red breeches and tights. <laughs> we only ever wear that in the presence of Her Majesty because she likes it. <laughs> 35 Yeoman warders are selected from the Yeoman body to come and live and work here in the town. This is our casual day-to-day -day wear. It is known as Blue Undress and is modelled on a Tudor tunic. It's made to be worn under a suit of armour. It's not a frock. These things are for the leg plates, all right? You want men in skirts? Scotland. <laughs> Although, you can get that kind of action in Soho. <laughs> and I'm sure the Royal Marines will be happy to tell you where. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now that I've got your questions out of the way, we can carry on talking about what we're supposed to. <coughs> You're now standing in a killing ground. Yeah, sadly no longer operational. <laughs> As an attacking army, you'd have lost dozens, possibly hundreds of men, trying to get through that festering bog of a moat, wrestling with the polar bears and trying to climb the walls. And all the time you're doing that, there are people trying to kill you. It is unlikely that you would have got this far, but if you did, unlucky. You might not have noticed this yet, but behind you there is another wall. The inner defensive wall dates from the 1220s, has 13 defensive towers and a 50-foot curtain. It was only one way through, that archway. And as you can see, it is defended by a two and a half ton oak and steel portcullis. And beyond it, those gates weigh a further three tons. Five and a half tons of oak and steel that you're going to have to hack through with your poxy little swords and axes. And that will take time. Time is a luxury you rarely have in battle. And the defenders will now be hurling vicious verbal abuse at you. Not to mention stones, arrows, buckets of boiling tar, cows, sheep, salad, unwanted children. Everything would have been thrown at you. It's not a healthy place to stand. In fact, you couldn't stand here. Up until the year 1275, this was the River Thames. You'd be drowning now. The lower left of the archway, you'll see there's a mooring loop for a boat that hasn't been used in 700 years, but bizarrely gets painted every 10. When the outer wall was built, it was a tremendous feat of military engineering. Yay. <laughs> military engineering. Yay. Yeah. The river had to be pushed back. This roadway was raised about six and a half metres, 20 feet to the height you're on today. This became the river entrance. Now, this is the world infamous Traitor's Gate, which is not its original name. Originally, and obviously, it was known as the Watergate. Um, for the simple reason that boats and barges would come in here and deliver stores and provisions. Because of that, it quickly became known as the Trader's Gate, like the tradesman's entrance, yeah? But in the 16th century, there was something of a human traffic, and that was largely one way. A lot of these people were prisoners, many accused of treason, and the watermen slid the name to Trader's Gate. Now, I will point out that the tower was not built as a prison, it was built as a palace and fortress and designed to keep people out. It was used to keep people in, and we have some famous traitors come through here. You might well have heard of some of them, Queen Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife, Queen Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, and these are Tudors. Tudors bore me stiff. I don't like talking about them, but I've got to, so I'll talk about those two floozies later when I show you where they were killed and where they lie to this day. Mel Gibson. No. Oh. Mel Gibson should have been brought through these gates and given a really hefty slap. Ever since the colossally inaccurate comedy film Braveheart, but a day goes by without some demented Scot, and I'm not saying you're all demented, it's just the ones I meet, uh, demanding to know, where did you keep William Wallace? He was my father. Check out my blue face. Family resemblance. And that's just the women. The men are much more vocal. It is true that in the winter of 1299, Sir William Wallace did pass through these gates, but you have already spent longer in the tower than Sir William Wallace ever did. Sir William Wallace was knighted by the Scottish court. 
And something you might not know about the English, but I can tell you with great authority as an Irishman, is that the English are a bunch of snobs. <coughs> they don't recognise any court but their own. They didn't recognise Sir William Wallace's title. They classed him a commoner. Commoners weren't held here, and nor were they beheaded for treason. Sir William Wallace was immediately taken from here to Smithfield Market, about a mile and a half to the northwest, <coughs> where, in full public view, he was hanged by the neck until. Yeah. until really uncomfortable, actually. They only half hanged him. They hauled him up, let him swing, let him down, took the noose from around his neck, and revived him. When he came round, he saw a knife, alarmingly, going into his chest. And it was pulled down in a line, nipples to navel. So he was opened up. It wasn't a fatal wound, and it wasn't meant to be. William Wallace was entirely conscious when his executioner's filthy hands plunged inside and disemboweled him. 36 feet of his intestines spilled out onto the pavement with a gush of blood which must have steamed in the cold winter air. <laughs> These entrails were then placed on a hot griddle where they sizzled. And at this point, Mel Gibson would have you believe a man can shout, Freedom! <laughs> I just don't think that's likely. He must have had other things on his mind. His heart was being ripped out, and that's got to be a distraction. The heart was thrown into a brazier to burn, and that probably killed him. The head was taken off, that was left on London Bridge, the body was hacked into four pieces, and those quarters were then sent north to the border towns between England and Scotland. Left on their gates to rot as a warning to the barbaric and troublesome Scots not to upset the clearly civilised peace-loving and harmonious <laughs> bloody English. So, Sir William Wallace, a truly great man from a truly great nation, was hanged, drawn and quartered. Yeah. One gets nostalgic. <laughs> and hungry. <laughs> On a happier note, behind you we have the Bloody Tower. Again, not its original name. Originally, this was known as the Garden Tower, and we've changed it for marketing purposes. <laughs> in 1483, the Garden Tower was so comfortable, this was the home of the King of England, Edward V. You might not have heard of him, he was only 12. His younger brother, Richard, the Duke of York, was just 10. And they were here under the protection of their uncle, Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. And they needed protection, because there was a war on. The War of the Roses. Now, this sounds like fun, but they weren't fighting with flowers. It was a bloody civil war, and it straggled on for nearly 30 years. These boys were targets, and Gloucester knew it. He took his protection duties so seriously that he had Parliament declare his nephews bastards. They couldn't keep the crown, and he took it. He became King Richard III. He was now the target. His nephews continued to play safely in these grounds long after his coronation. All of that's fact, documented, and unargued. It is also a fact possibly a sad one, that these lads disappeared. Nobody knows when, why or how, but Shakespeare tells us that one night in 1483 they fell asleep up there and never woke up. During the night they were smothered to death with their own pillows. Stab with a dagger for good measure. Now I'd like you children, especially you young children, to think about that at bedtime. <laughs> um, your mummies and daddies are going to tell you that that was a long time ago, and that's true. They're going to tell you there are no more bad men. <laughs> that's a lie. There are bad men. There are very, very bad men. They're not always out there, though. Sometimes they're under your bed. <laughs> wardrobe. They wait for you to go to sleep, and that's when they strike. <laughs> Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> really don't like children. No, no. Their disappearance was a mystery for nearly 200 years. In 1674, workmen on the south side of the White Tower removed a stone stairwell. Under that stairwell there was a box, and inside this box were the dusty remains of two children. The experts at the time declared them to be the bones of the princes, and Charles II commanded that they should be laid to rest in Westminster Abbey in Innocent's Corner, which he'd named in their honour. Who killed him? Don't know. Shakespeare would have you believe it was Uncle Richard, but let us not forget that Shakespeare was writing to amuse a redhead, and you never upset a redhead. <laughs> she was Elizabeth I. Her grandfather was Henry Tudor. He defeated Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. He had no real claim to the throne, but he took the crown from Richard's dead head and 
placed it upon his own. He declared himself king. He could not have done that if these lads had been alive. And it's entirely possible that Henry Tudor had those boys murdered. You see, Shakespeare couldn't write that. History is nearly always written by the people who win. This explains all the empty pages in French history books. <laughs> you do know that what Shakespeare referred to as the Tower of Blood, Elizabeth I chose to name the Bloody Tower. The gateway to the inner ward, and we're about to charge through it. Charge is a military term. It means to move rapidly to engage in eager combat with an enemy. So let's not have the Italians at the front. <laughs> we charge. We charge. We charge. We charge. We just charge. make sure that you're all insulted. I don't want any of you claiming any sort of prejudice or anything like that. If you're feeling left out, just let me know. Come in closer. It's the sort of game we have. Do I know you? No. <laughs> I've seen you somewhere. Okay. Now, everything that we've seen so far has been designed and built purely to defend this picture. It's a very important picture. It is protecting the scaffolding, which is helping our restoration team restore what we call the Norman Keep or White Tower, rather stupidly built under the approach lanes to two airports. <laughs> My employers now insist that I tell you that there were no airports in the 11th century. If I depart from the truth, I must make it clear. William, Duke of Normandy, also known as William the Bastard, defeated King Harold II at the Battle of Hastings on October the 14th, 1066. On Christmas Day that year, he was crowned William, the first of that name in England. His coronation took place at Westminster Hall. You should go and visit it while you're in London. You can stand on the spot where he was crowned. On that day, all the defeated Saxon warlords were in there. They were told to take their daughters with them to witness the coronation. But before the coronation, their daughters suffered a terrible fate. Some of these girls were as young as eight years old. They were forced to marry the Norman warlords. They were made to marry Frenchmen. <laughs> After this mass wedding ceremony, the coronation took place, but the coronation did not go without a hitch. It was a Saxon tradition when a new chief was named to let off a mighty cheer. But these were warlords. It wasn't hip hip hooray, it was a full throated battle roar. Now nobody told the Normans that that was going to happen. The Norman guard honestly thought the king had been murdered and they charged in. Arms were hacked off, heads were split and people were run through before they realised that the Saxons were just paying their respect. Not the prettiest coronation in our history, but by far the most entertaining. And it kind of set the tone for the next 12 years. William had to put down rebellion and insurrection just about everywhere until the year 1078. In 1078, his spin doctors began calling him the Conqueror and he felt safe enough to begin work on this, his principal palace and fortress here in London. Work took 20 years to complete. And for nearly 500 years, kings and queens lived on the top floor. The floor below was accommodation for their most favored knights and their ladies. And the lowest floor with windows that's where the kitchens were. There is another floor. It's partly below ground. The walls there are 15 feet thick. There are no windows. It's dark. We're close to the river. It is always damp and cold. And this, come on now, this was the perfect place for the, the wine. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've told you this was not built as a prison, it was built as a palace. Pay attention. I did rather lead you on that path though, didn't I? I'm trained in psychological warfare, you see. Took you right where you wanted to go and then just pulled the rug from under your feet. Our first prisoner was a Frenchman. His name was Ranulph de Flambard and he was the Bishop of Durham. Now it would be madness to lock a French bishop or indeed any bishop, 
in a wine cellar. <laughs> so he was imprisoned in the top of that turret. The year was 1100, but by 1101 he'd noticed a few things. The warders liked to drink, so he threw them a party. And he had wine brought up from the cellar in casks, which he'd noticed were bound round with rope. And the warders did what they do best. Ate far too much, drank far too much, and fell asleep. Ran off to Flambard, saw his moment and seized it. He removed the rope from these casks, and this ancient French bishop abseiled 90-odd <laughs> feet on an improvised line and got away. Our first prisoner escaped. <laughs> Did we learn from this? No. In the tower's long history, we had three and a half thousand prisoners, and of these, 81 have escaped. An escape ratio of? I just swim, I don't do bats. Uh, no, okay. Yeah, an escape ratio of? One in 42. Statistically, the Tower of London is one of the least secure prisons anywhere in the world. <laughs> Rubbish. You are quite right. However, it was not until the turn of the 16th century that the wine rack was put to one side and another rack was installed. <coughs> Just one moment. Excuse me, sir. Be quiet! This is a palace, not a playground! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I can't hear myself speak. I don't know how you can hear it over that racket. <laughs> right. What was I talking about? The rack. The rack, the rack yeah. The rack. Another rack was installed. This rack had a sinister purpose. Torture. And torture is misunderstood. Many people think of torture as a punishment. It isn't. It just feels that way. <laughs> Torture is a way to keep a conversation going. <laughs> it is a tool of interrogation. And by far the most famous interrogation that took place here was that of Guy Fawkes. Guy Fawkes is famous in English history for being the only man to have entered Parliament with honest, noble intentions, a clear agenda and the resources to see it through. Something that you won't find in our government any time soon. <laughs> he was going to blow the place up, but he got caught. James I would have been killed in the blast and he was desperate to learn who was in Guy's gang. Guy was saying nothing. The interrogators asked if they could use torture. And a torture warrant was signed. Only 48 torture warrants have been issued and actioned in the tower since the year 1215. Does anyone know why that year is significant? It was the signing of the Magna Carta which outlawed the use of torture in England. Unless... Royal consent had been given, and it was in the national interest. Yeah. Wow. James I was quite an interested party. Guy Fawkes had tried to kill him. He was desperate to learn who was in Guy's gang. So, Guy Fawkes was bound by his wrists and ankles to two spindles. These spindles were set in the rack. By means of a ratchet mechanism in the middle, the spindles turned in opposite directions. So he began to stretch. An osteopath had charged you a fortune for this. But on our rack, you could stretch a man nearly four inches. With the three inch point, any therapeutic value is lost. <laughs> joints get pulled apart. Now your joints are held together with ligament and tendon, and these are stronger than bone. When your joints get pulled apart, it is in fact your bones that break, but not cleanly. They come away in a flake fracture, it covers a lot of surface area and nerve endings. Lots of pain! That's what we're talking about here. They all cracked on the rack. Are you alright? <laughs> Just looked a bit giddy there for a minute. <laughs> now then, some say Guy Fawkes didn't crack, but he did sign a confession, and that was as good as a death warrant. He was taken from here to Westminster Palace Yard, and there, a commoner, guilty of treason, like Sir William Wallace, he was hanged, drawn, and Reported. Unlike Wallace, he didn't suffer. So brutal had been his racking that as he made his way up the gallows steps, he collapsed and died. But they carried on anyway. This remains a place of torture. It's a gift shop now. <laughs> Although my employers insist, I tell you, that shopping in our gift shop is a happy and pleasant experience. <laughs> I'm sure they're right. <laughs> Especially if you like spending your hard-earned money on cheap tax at extortionate prices. <laughs> I hope you're going to put that one on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, 
<laughs> you go in the White Tower today, uh, you'll note that it is a marvel, a wonder of medieval defensive architecture. And you might be forgiven for thinking that in medieval times people were small because you have to bend your head to go through the doorways. If you bend your head to go through a doorway, just take a glimpse to your right. You will notice that there's an empty space. If you were attacking the fortress, that space wouldn't be empty. It would be occupied by a man with a mace or club. And as you bent your head to come in, your head would get the good news. <laughs> in such a space, a man could hold off a battalion. It's great, isn't it? As you go up the stairways, you'll notice that they usually spiral in one direction, with one notable exception, which is Flamstead Stairs. But they spiral in one direction, so that you, if you're coming up, you have to fight left-handed, which isn't good for most people. However, if you're defending, you're clear to fight right-handed. And if you are running up the stairs, and please do, you will fall over. Um, Every now and again there is a step which is asynchronous. It's a couple of inches taller than all the steps preceding it. This step will trip you up. <laughs> it is known by the unimaginative name Trip Stair. <laughs> the most notable of these is actually in the Bloody Tower. So really give it some of those staircases. Okay. Now then, when you go in the White Tower today, you'll see the armour of the kings. Shield, lance, sword, bayonet, rifle. Pistols, muskets, cannons, mortars, big boys' toys. <laughs> but in there, gentlemen, you're going to feel woefully, woefully inadequate at a very personal level. <laughs> Check out Henry VIII's armour. You'll know what I mean when you see it. But I consider it a duty to warn you that those codpiece are an early foray into psychological warfare. As you're all civilians, you probably don't understand psychological warfare, so I'm now going to give you a lesson. Bet you thought I was bald, didn't you? <laughs> Do you all see my head? Yes. yes. Do you all see my head? Yes. Do you see my hat? Yes. Psychological. My head doesn't go to the top, but it is your natural assumption that it does. This makes me look taller and more fierce. Ah. I want you to look at the cod piece, think of the hat. <laughs> Which is going to be very important for you two fellas. <laughs> on now to Tower Green and the heart of darkness in English history. Come on now, let's go. Now I know that you ladies have not come here to listen to some grumpy old soldier ran on about all this blood gore or indeed medieval defensive architecture which is a fascinating subject. You ladies have come here for the crown jewel, the bling thing, but not because you're interested in their history, you're not. You just want to make the man you're with feel inadequate. Again, and you will. Under that clock you'll find a door. When you go through it you will see the world's largest perfect cut diamond at 531 carats. It is about the size of an egg. Do not compare your engagement rings with the star of Africa. You'll also see what is largely regarded as the world's most beautiful diamond, the koh -Nor, the light of India. We've stolen them from everywhere. <laughs> Although Her Majesty's government insists, I tell you, that they were given to us by grateful nations. Often at gunpoint, they don't know that you had. Along this roadway to your left, you'll find the entrance to the bloody tower, you can go there, you can learn more about who may have killed those two boys and learn also about Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh is one of my favourite characters in the story of Britain. An outstanding seaman and navigator, a great explorer and adventurer, some would say a pirate, and they're probably right. In his packed and busy life, Sir Walter Raleigh managed to spend 13 years in there as a prisoner and he was tortured every day. They locked his wife in there with him. <laughs> oh, you, you don't need a machine to break a man. <laughs> You're going to find that out too one day. You may already have. <laughs> have you been heartbroken yet? <laughs> yeah, I suppose you have to have a heart for that, don't you? <laughs> Over here in the corner we have the Queen's House. This was built as a wedding present for Anne Boleyn. The work commenced on this in 1533, the year of the wedding. 
completed in 1541, five years after her execution. <laughs> now the home of the Governor of the Tower of London and his family, being guarded today by soldiers, and I do mean soldiers, of the Coldstream Guards. In their famous bear skin helmets and greatcoats today. And uh, just in case you're wondering, their heads don't go to the top either. <laughs> some of these young soldiers have recently returned from combat operations in Afghanistan. And some of them will shortly go back there. That weapon you see is live. It is the standard British Army rifle with bayonet. Do not upset the soldiers! <laughs> Got that? <laughs> they do deserve your respect. This is tar green. It's colour coded. It's the grass. I have to explain that because a lot of people spend an hour or so looking for a green tower. These people are Europeans. <laughs> Europeans are nice enough people, I guess, but they do have syntax problems and talk like Yoda. So, tower green. Grass it is. <laughs> Hopefully that's cleared that up for you. You can visit the Beecham Tower. That arched window there lets light into a chamber, the walls of which are covered with graffiti. Some of that graffiti is nearly 500 years old. Graffiti is not a new problem. Modern art is a new problem. <laughs> this monstrosity! Not you. <laughs> <laughs> Perspect granite and tubular steel is a monument to traitors and mutineers and should not exist. Traitors and mutineers should have no monuments. There are no crimes worse than treason or mutiny. I have to express that as a personal opinion. I don't know of any other nation that would mark such a historic place with such a worthless piece of tat. <laughs> this is the site of the private execution scaffold, and it was here that Henry VIII had two of his wives beheaded. Many husbands bring their wives back to admire the place. <laughs> the first of these was, of course, Queen Anne Boleyn. She was Henry VIII's second wife. His first wife was Catherine of Aragon, a Spaniard, and they were happily married for 17 years. Actually married for 23 years. The last six years were rather blighted by the fact that she couldn't give him a son. She'd given him a daughter, but that wasn't good enough. It really is. So he divorced her, married Anne Boleyn. Like Catherine, she gave him a daughter, but she could not give him a son. And she tried hard, really hard, and not just with Henry. <laughs> now, I don't care what your romantic, sentimental attachment might be to the myth in your head that is Anne Boleyn. I don't care if you do have the DVD box set of the Tudors, well. watch every episode back to back on a Thursday, know the script inside out because you don't have a life. <laughs> and I don't want to know if you were Anne Boleyn in a previous incarnation. On average, I meet three of you a year. You can't all be right. You are barking mad and delusional. You're not special, you're sick. Get out. Anne Boleyn should not be admired, copied or emulated in any way. She was found guilty by a court of adultery with seven men, including her brother. When you're married to the king, that's treason, and I don't care who you're married to, it is a bit excessive and not a little weird. <laughs> not for her, the block and act. On the 19th of May, 1536, as she knelt there praying for forgiveness, a Frenchman took off her head with one stroke of a two-handed sword. And it was beautiful. She didn't know she was dead. When her head was raised from the straw, the records tell us that the select audience gasped in amazement and horror that so quick had been the execution that as her severed head came up, they were horrified to see her eyes continued to gaze around at the faces in the crowd and for quite some time, whilst her neck dripped blood, her lips continued to move. But isn't that just like a woman? You know? <laughs> last word, last word. <laughs> last word. <laughs> they just don't know when to shut up, do they? <laughs> Did you think she'd take the hint? But no. <laughs> She was so convinced she was going to get a reprieve, no arrangement had been made for a funeral, and there was no coffin. Anne Boleyn, Queen of England, obviously quite a bit shorter now, had to be stuffed inside a humble arrow box. That arrow box lies inside that chapel. Under the altar, just to the left as you look at it, is the final resting place of Queen Anne Boleyn. The next day, Henry galloped off to propose to Jane Seymour. Remarkably, she said yes. 
And just 11 days after the execution of Anne Boleyn, they were married. Why the rush? Well, they were married on the 30th of May, 1536. In late September, just a few months later, she gave him a son. At last, Henry had what he wanted. But sadly, she only delivered half a placenta. Now, that's probably too much information. Uh, but for those of you who know about these things, you will realize that she was in a bit of trouble. Before the day was out, she bled to death. Henry now had three children he could talk about and no wife. In the modern era, a man might turn to the internet. <laughs> and Henry did something similar with the same results. He had a portrait painter called Holbein tour Europe looking for likely candidates for marriage. In a town called Claver in Germany, he painted a girl called Anne. Anne of Claver. But when the portrait was handed to Henry, he looked at it and pronounced it Anne of Cleves. And no one argued. <laughs> We've mispronounced it ever since. He fell in love with Anne of Cleves' portrait. And they were married in absentia, which is not a small town near Luxembourg. It meant that neither of them were present at the ceremony. And the first time Henry VIII met his wife, they'd been married for three weeks. He met her here. He is reported to have bellowed when he saw her, My God, she looks like a horse! And not one I'd like to ride. <laughs> Holbein had made himself scarce. You see, he was an artist. He painted things that we don't see. <laughs> Inner beauty. <laughs> the marriage was annulled. Although something you might not know about Anne of Cleves, she stayed on at court, she remained Henry's good friend and confidant throughout his life, and she actually ran his household right up until his death. That's character. <laughs> Henry VIII's fifth wife was another matter. Her name was Catherine Howard. And academics argue over the age of this girl. Some suggest she was as young as 14. I don't buy that myself. But she was certainly no older than 17 when her father forced her to marry the king. He was now in his 50s, morbidly obese, with ulcerating wounds on his legs which stank, indicating diabetes. And in those days that couldn't be treated. He had a selection of other diseases that would have responded well to penicillin, had that been around. Diseases of a social nature. He had a yeoman of the bedchamber, and it was his job to lift Henry into and out of bed. He required two assistants for this purpose. No man in that condition should marry such a young girl. He really wasn't up to the task of being a newlywed husband on their wedding night. He rather embarrassed himself and he took his frustrations out on Catherine and there is some evidence to suggest that she was beaten. She felt betrayed and abandoned by her father. There was no love in the marriage. She sought love outside, she had an affair, she got caught. She admitted her adultery. But here on the scaffold, she went a stage further and proclaimed it. I die, the Queen of England, she said. I'm ready. Much rather would I have lived and died as a humble wife of the only man to have truly loved me, Thomas Culpepper. She probably shouldn't have said that. Thomas Culpepper certainly thought so. He was hanged, drawn and quartered for his part in the affair. Catherine Howard was, of course, beheaded. But then Henry did something really sick. He had quicklime put into her casket. And this dissolved her body. It turned it to sludge. It doesn't seem a big deal these days, but in Tudor Christianity, there was the belief that you needed a body in order to rise from the dead on the Day of Judgment. Henry VIII had effectively denied Catherine an afterlife. And he'd also denied God the ability to judge her. When the public found out about that, they were terrified. You shouldn't be terrified of your king. The king is there for your protection. Henry VIII had become the tyrant that Sir Thomas More had said he would be. Now, Sir Thomas More was his closest friend and best advisor. They were old school chums. And when Henry VIII wanted to make himself head of church and head of state, Thomas More did his job. He advised the king. Don't do that, sir, he said. Too much power in one man shall surely lead to tyranny. And not to prove the point or anything, Henry VIII had him beheaded for saying that. 400 years later, in 1935, Sir Thomas More was made a saint of the Catholic Church. And saint Thomas More also lies in there. 
Henry's final wife was Catherine Parr. She was a bit closer to his own age, she was 30. <laughs> she was a widow and a skilled nurse and that was important to Henry. It's a great comfort to me that Henry's last years were characterised by pain and that he may well have died in considerable agony. I've never liked Henry VIII. Trumped up. Egotist. Can't stand it. But I know you all love him deep down. You go inside the chapel, be advised that it is a place of worship. There is no photography allowed inside. And if you have a mobile phone, you should switch it off. If it goes off inside the chapel, God strikes you down dead with a thunderbolt. <laughs> Although my employers now insist I tell you it might not be a thunderbolt. But God will get you in the end. There is a Yemen warder on duty in there. His job is there for security to make sure you don't steal anything. He's not there to answer your questions. That is a place of quiet reflection. Got that? Yep. Okay. Well, it's all been a bit grim, hasn't it? The good news is, it's all over. Now, if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask any of my colleagues as you wonder about the tower. They'll be only too pleased to talk to you. I do mean that, especially the ones with the cage. They know the answers to everything. <laughs> now, ladies, I'm sure that you're going to go over and look at the crown jewels. <laughs> When you go to the Crown Jewels, there will be a bit of a queue. Your man will be stood next to you in that queue. Smiling, uncomplaining, he may even engage you in small talk. One thing he won't say to you ladies is that he doesn't want to be there, but believe me, he doesn't want to be there. No real man wants to look at jewels. To a man, rubies, diamonds, sapphires and emeralds are just bits of compressed carbon with an element of chromium thrown in here and there. You cannot eat them, you cannot drink them. <laughs> to a man they are nothing. He is there wasting his life because you want to be there. He is there because this is what you want to do. This is selfless love. <laughs> that love should be repaid this evening. <laughs> this evening you should take your man to a pub. There you should buy him beer. You should sit quietly and complaining, and smiling as he watches the rugby, cricket or football. And the only words you should say are more beer, dear. Or would you like some nuts without you, handsome beast? <laughs> Ladies, do you understand? Yes. yes. Gentlemen? Your evening is reasonably secure. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to say that's all the time I have to speak with you. But they say here you're only ever as good as your audience. And believe me, it's no fun if you stood on this block and the audience does not engage. You engage rather brilliantly today. It's a cold day, you stuck with it, you laughed in most of the right places. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure showing you around. Even the people from Australia. <laughs> Thank you very much.